I first want to express my gratitude to Boulder Reach for the work that they're doing in the world and for making this evening possible and also to Veronique Foster and Tom Foster for all their help in making this happen. So, as we begin in the book, humanity is at a critical juncture. We have so many good things happening, the achievements that have been wrought over the last several decades in particular offer hope of a vast renewal and perhaps even a golden age for society. On the other hand, we have a constellation of seemingly insurmountable critical issues that threaten us perhaps as never before. So the question then becomes, how do we get to that golden age? How do we resolve these critical issues? So I'd like to first talk tonight about tools. Tools are things that make, facilitate things, make things happen. And I brought a special toolbox with me tonight to illustrate a key point. <clears throat> Let me just open this up. Yes. So inside this toolbox, we have a hammer. We also have another hammer. <laughs> and surprise, surprise, another hammer. This, if I could find it, <clears throat> is a US dollar bill. This is a 10 euro note. Now these two bills have different motifs, different colors, different nations, actually multiple nations of origin, but they're both national currencies. And just like the Japanese yen and the Mexican peso and all of the other national currencies in our world, they are all bank debt, interest bearing fiat currencies. They are the monetary equivalent of a hammer. They're all the same type of currency. <clears throat> so just as it takes a number of tools to build a house, it takes many different monetary tools to build a global economy. And not just a global economy. We're using the equivalent of a hammer, a monetary hammer, to try to ad address our social issues, our ecological issues, when these national currencies are actually just business currencies. They were brought into being several hundred years ago to foster the commerce, international trade, and the Industrial Revolution. They're industrial age monetary hammers. <coughs> so to build a society, a global economy, with agricultural, uh, industrial and post-industrial economies with many different needs and, and requirements and <clears throat> diverse values and sometimes contrasting values. The one set of monetary tools we're using now makes that job a lot more difficult. So what I want to talk about is some new monetary tools like monetary paintbrushes, monetary screwdrivers, things that are, can be applied to the vastly different requirements of our day. And <clears throat> I want to apply those monetary tools to the various applications, the various crises we're facing today. But I want to begin with an historical period that happened a long, long time ago, but which has, I believe, direct application to what's taking place today, the political debate. Uh, today is the, what, first Tuesday of sequestration. Uh, and so on top of all the man-made crises that we've had with other realms, we now have manufactured crises on top of our economic woes here in this country. <clears throat> so let me start with this historical period and try to draw some links between the relevance of what happened then to what's taking place today. The period in history, in European history, between the fall of Rome and the European Renaissance, between the late 400s and the 1400s, to late 1400s, that 1,000 year period 
is called the Middle Ages. It's also called the Medieval Age. It's also been referred to as the Dark Ages. Um, <clears throat> in the latter part of the Middle Ages, we had the outbreak of the plague. And 19th century scholarship assumed that that entire millennium was one of dismal poverty, primitive lifestyles culminating in the plague of the 1300s. <clears throat> We now know, and it's only in recent decades that we know this, that there was a period in between uh, the pre-dark ages of the, the first centuries and the latter dark ages, there was this middle period called the Central Middle Ages that was anything but dark. There was a prosperity that we can only envy at today. There was a wealthy higher class, upper class, and then there was a vast, vibrant middle class in fact, there's little evidence whatsoever of any significant poverty for that entire 250-year period. There was work for all with very favorable working conditions. Um, <clears throat> Sunday was the day of the Lord. Monday was the blue Monday set aside for uh, private matters. In addition, they had from 90 to as many as 170 official holidays each year. There was uh, three to four meals a day, three to four courses for lunch and dinner, whereas daily caloric intake today averages about 3,000 calories in developed countries. Back then, the daily caloric intake was 3,500 to 4,000 calories per day. Uh, the arts flourished. Uh, industry that is thought to have begun with the Industrial Revolution, actually started hundreds of years earlier during this period. Um, there was work, as I said, for all. And this age is now being called uh, by historians the first modernization, the true European takeoff, and the first true renaissance. Uh, the university system thought to have, uh, happening, uh, thought to have taken place during the uh, renaissance actually started hundreds of years earlier during this period. Uh, abstract sciences, such as mathematics, uh, took place during this period as well. It's also been called the age of cathedrals, as this period, this 250-year period, is considered by historians to be the greatest period of construction the world, or at least the Western world, has ever known. All of the great cathedrals, almost all of the great cathedrals of Western Europe, were built during this time. And we know these today. They're still standing and, and functioning today. Notre Dame, Chartres, and, and most of the other great cathedrals. And if anybody's ever been there, you know of the craftsmanship that went into this. Uh, I have seen very little in modern, modern times to compare to these edifices. So these cathedrals in particular bring up an interesting question. These cathedrals took hundreds, sometimes hundreds of years, definitely generations to build. And interestingly, and in contrast to what we think today, that those churches, those monasteries, those cathedrals were not built by the church. They were not paid for by the church. They were actually built and paid for by that vibrant middle class. And it took tens of thousands of man hours to put these things together. So the question then becomes, well, how did they get this great prosperity? OK, how, how did they manage to spend so much time devoted to public works? What happened during that period that we're missing today? Well, it turns out that during the Central Middle Age period, there was two, two sets of, of toolboxes. We had something equivalent to our national currencies today, back then as well. But in addition, we had a, a dual currency system whereby the second currency was a local currency. And many of these local currencies had a very special uh, attribute, a thing called demurrage. Whereas today we have positive interest rates on our money. If you borrow money from the bank, you're going to have to pay that back, and you're going to also have to pay the interest on that. Well, these local currencies with demurrage charge, these local tools, um, had a negative interest rate. What does that mean? That means that you get some money and you better use it very quickly. Otherwise, there's a tax for holding on to the money. 
So it acted like a hot potato. As soon as you get it, you want to get rid of it. And so what this did was create what we call a velocity of exchange, far greater than anything we have today. As soon as you get the money, you use it and pass it on. And so this money circulated and circulated and circulated from the upper class to the middle class, and everybody was able to meet their basic needs with this local currency. The national currency was also in use, but it was used mostly for foreign exchange and for luxury items. The basic needs of, of most people were met through this local exchange. And that helped foster, I believe, and Bernard believes, uh, one of the greatest ages known to humankind. There's another interesting feature of this age that I want to go into for a moment. And again, we go back to the cathedrals. Notre Dame means Our Lady. So here we are during this Middle Age period, and almost the entirety of these cathedrals were dedicated not to Jesus, whose religion this is supposed to be about. Almost every single one of these cathedrals were dedicated to the Great Mother. This is important, very, very important. During this period also, the women had a freedom that we have not seen since or before. Even today in most countries around the world, people do not, the women, do not have the same rights available to them that they had back then. Women were involved in most of the major professions. They were in political leaderships. Um, they had these double monasteries with men and women. But the person in charge of these double monasteries was not the abbot. It was the abbess. Uh, women were landowners. Women participated in almost every aspect of society. So this golden age comes to an end. And history teaches us that the great plague that took place in the mid-1300s and which endured for about 120 to 150 years and decimated between a third and a half of Europe's population. Um, this period, according to historians, just kind of happened. It's an exogenous event that just came about in and of its own, destroyed this culture, and then you have, what? Whatever came next. We now know that this great plague was preceded by about 50 or 60 years of economic upheaval, comparable to our Great Depression and our Great Recession and a few other things. What happened was, in about 1265, uh, King Louis IX, I believe, he uh, became a more of an authoritarian figure, centralized power. And when he did so, he also centralized the money system and he got rid of these complementary currencies. This was followed in 1295 uh, by another contraction that took place with another king from France. And these two monetary events took this 250 year period into upheaval. And so for the next 50 or 60 years, you had famines, you had all sorts of things breaking out. Uh, society is in major destruction mode and by the time 1347 came about, the Great Plague came into being because the environment for 50 or 60 years allowed for that. So when we think today of sequestration and some of the rancor that goes on in our political debate, the misogyny, and you start to think about what happened during this period a thousand years ago and how this remarkable society very quickly went downhill. It takes on added meaning for me, for Bernard, and I think for others as well. And this idea of the linkage between the feminine and money is not something new, and it wasn't something that just happened in the Central Middle Ages. Uh, another society that we are all well familiar with on some level uh, that had an, an enviable economy in the ancient world was dynastic Egypt. And their economy endured for the better part of 25 to 3,000 years 
And a large part of that period, they had the same thing happening. They had a dual currency system. They had a local uh, currency that had a demurrage charge. There was an honoring of the feminine that was not seen anywhere else like that that we know of in that period of history. And then, after 2,000 years of this enviable economy, Rome comes in, and they change the monetary system to the Roman system. And within a matter of years, after 2,000 years of prosperity, Egypt became a developing nation from which it has never recovered. And at the same time, when Rome came in, women's rights went downhill as well. Now, I'm not saying that there's a linear causality between one and the other. It's more like a mutual causality. They're both part of something greater still that unites these type of currencies that nurture us and these other type of currencies that are basically our industrial aged national currency is it can be easily seen as a patriarchal currency. It only allows for a certain amount of activities like competition, like hierarchy. And it's not that these things are bad, but when they're the only game in town, you get what you get. And so what we have going on today in our political debate, to me, is a lot more serious than not. These rights that have been hard earned, and you, you hear these, what? <laughs> these statements about abortion, as if this was the most important issue of our day. But in some respects, it is, because it's part, part of a greater constellation of things. So one other point I want to make about the feminine and money is that the word money itself comes from the Roman goddess Juno Moneta. She was the great mother archetype type of Rome, in whose care we were all supposed to be nurtured. And the means by which that's supposed to happen is through money, which is why it has her name. And most of the other ancient forms of money are almost all of them dedicated to their version of the great mother. So they seem to know something that we've forgotten and that we need to remember. And I think quickly. Here we are with Mother Earth and the way we treat her at this moment. These are all things that may sound new agey or boulderish, but they're actually fundamentally important to civilization. So let's talk about these tools and, I don't know, work. Here we are in the last several years having lost more jobs than any time during the, uh, since the Great Depression. And people will say we're in, we're out, we're in recession. I would say that we're much closer to depression than not. When young people graduate college today, good luck finding a job. When skilled workers can't get even uh, half of what they had before the recession in terms of work and employment, that to me is a major sign. So, Consider this, that work, the work that needs to get done in our country and around the world, there's no end to it. To rebuilding our and revitalizing our cities, our environs, to our infrastructure, on and on and on. There's so much work that needs to get done. And then on the other side of the equation, we have all these willing workers, many of them skilled, many of them just coming out of school, but this legion of workers hungering for work opportunities. So you have the work that needs to get done, and you have all these workers. There's only one thing missing in this equation, the money to pay for it all, at least money in the form of national currencies. But we have all of these other monetary pieces, these monetary tools available to us to allow all of this to happen. And what kind of world is it if you have work and you have workers and you can't put them together? <laughs> We're exploring different galaxies and we can't even get that thing straightened out here. And consider that these ancient societies figured it out and did very well, thank you, for hundreds if not thousands of years. And here we are from one week to the next with the next Washington crisis. So, <clears throat> work. 
I'd like to go back just to the Great Depression for a moment to explore something that happened back then, which is little known, but I think has relevance again to what's going on today. Germany was one of the most hard hit countries economically uh, before the, uh, the Depression. They were, in 1913, prior to the outbreak of World War I, the conversion rate of a US dollar to a German mark was $1 to 4.2 marks. Fast forward 10 years to November 1923, when hyperinflation hit. And then the conversion rate changed from $1 to 4.2 trillion marks. It was a trillion <laughs> fold increase. Um, a postage stamp cost billions. You needed a wheelbarrow, literally, a wheelbarrow full of money to get a loaf of bread. Daily salary negotiations were uh, preceded work. Um, they, the, the wages were paid twice per day and spent within the hour. This is all history. I mean, it's, it's all very well documented. And then the depression hits a number of years later, and unemployment soared, went into double-digit unemployment. And a lot of the Germans were trying to figure out how to make their basic needs met. Well, in one town, the town of Schwanenkirchen, it was a coal mining town. The main employer there was the coal mine, and it went belly up. And one of the workers there decided to try to reopen the mine, and what they would use is a complementary currency with a demurrage charge. This is in the middle of the depression I'm talking about. So what happens? Within a matter of weeks, the shopkeepers and the other local store owners um, started accepting the complementary currency. And within a few, a few weeks after that, while the rest of the country languished in double-digit unemployment, Schwann and Kitchen had full employment within weeks. About 2,000 businesses around the country started accepting the VADA, this complementary currency, and banks started opening up accounts in the VADA. And all of these entities that started using the complementary currencies were facing the same results. They started having employment again. So what happened was that the VADA was so successful that it created its own demise. What happened was the central bank, the uh, Reichsbank, uh, started seeing the VADA as a threat to their own hegemony in the issuance of money. And so they had this complementary currency declared illegal. And within about, with another monetary piece that also occurred, uh, by 1933, there was 30% unemployment. And one person started talking about centralized uh, authoritarian rule over the monetary system that would bring the country back into the fore and create employment. And that was Adolf Hitler. In neighboring Austria, just, just, uh, just to make the case that this is not a unique single event that occurred, in neighboring Austria, in the city of Virgo, the very same thing happened. They noted the success of the Vada. They adopted the same thing in, in their city. And within a matter of weeks, while the rest of Austria, too, was exhibiting 30% unemployment, Virgil had full employment within a matter of weeks. And what happened was the uh, states, statesmen and economists from around the world came to see this miracle. And this is what it was called, the miracle of Virgil. And in fact, uh, the leading economic superstar of that time was an American named Irving Fisher out of Yale. He, he saw what was happening in Virgil. He and Russell Sprague from Harvard, and then under Secretary of the Treasury, Dean Acheson, all met with Roosevelt when he came into office. And it was Fisher who said, for the record, that the correct adoption of these complementary currencies would end the Depression in a matter of three weeks. Obviously, Roosevelt did not use these complementary currencies. His political advisors told him he'd get more credit for uh, going ahead with the New Deal. He went ahead with the New Deal. We now know, 50 years after the fact, that it was not the New Deal. But it was rather our preparation and entry into World War II that brought an end to the Great Depression in the United States. 
So these complementary currencies, we call them local currencies. And today we use them mostly on a local basis. But they have the potential to do so much more. Every single major crisis in our world today, every single one of them, is either directly or indirectly linked to this monetary paradigm that we have in place right now. So not only can these monetary tools prevent job, uh, create new jobs, but they could also prevent job losses. I just want to mention one other complementary currency with regard to employment, which is now taking place in Switzerland, which this, this particular currency is called the Vir, and it was started at the very same time that these, the Virgil and the Vada were created, but it has endured to this day. And starting with 13 businesses, it now enjoys over 65,000 businesses throughout Switzerland. And there was recently a study done at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and they credit this particular complementary currency um, with the fact that Switzerland, while the rest of the world went through this recession in 2008 with tens of millions of job losses, Switzerland had very little negative impact. What happens is, when we have this liquidity issue, when business is good and booming, the banks are more than eager to extend credit. That's how they make their money. But when a normal period goes into a boon, and partly caused by these banks that keep throwing credit money at people because of a healthy environment, well, sooner or later, you, can, you know that there's going to be a bust. And this is inevitable. It always happens. There's never been an, an example that it hasn't happened during this national currency paradigm that we've had for two, 300 years. By the way, before this national currency paradigm, you didn't have booms and busts. The central Middle Ages didn't have booms and busts. Dynastic Egypt, as far as we could tell, didn't have any disruption of the economy for over 2,000 years. Here, we're lucky if we get a few years of break in between the next bust. In fact, according to the World Bank, in one 25-year period alone, from 1975 to 1999, and this was considered to be one of the better economic periods, well, during that time, we had 169 banking and about 95 monetary crises, not problems, crises around the world. So when you have a foundation that's so unstable, and threatens so much, I think it's time to take a second look. And if there are tools available to us, why not use them? You know, when I, when I started looking into, uh, and, and my gratitude to Bernard Leotard for introducing me to so much of this work, but when you start looking at this, it really is, it's almost unbelievable that we're allowing so much in terms of our suffering to continue when there are these two tools available to us and when nobody, nobody need lose by the transformation that these tools can bring to us. I, I just want to mention one other uh, example and then I, I want to talk a little bit of an educational um, model, but I want to mention one other example that I think is important. Again, these supposed local currencies, and they are, have so much power. Curitiba is the uh, capital of the southeastern state of Paraná in Brazil. Its population in 1942 was about 120,000. Uh, in the 1990s, the city's population mushroomed to over 2.3 million. Most of the people there lived in favelas. Many of the people were unemployed. And in these favelas, these shanty towns, the roads were so small that the garbage trucks couldn't get in to pick up the garbage. And all sorts of diseases broke out. Jaime Lerner became mayor of Curitiba in 1971. He realized that there was no money in the coffers. There was no ability to take out loans from the federal government. He refused to take money from the World Bank and the IMF. And what he did was he realized that they had unused or underused resources. And what he did was 
begin to link the unused resources with the unmet needs of Curitiba. So this garbage problem, um, what they used as resources was two things. One, it was a Paraná, a Curitiba and Paraná, it's a very fertile area of Brazil. There's a lot of food growing naturally. And on top of that, they had a municipal bus system that was underutilized. It ran 24-7, but people couldn't afford it. And they had no place to go because they were jobless. So what he did was he made use of the bus tokens and started using that as a form of complementary currency, a complementary tool. And what he did was he got the children in the favelas to pick up pre-assorted garbage, bring it to a collection site. They would get the tokens. The tokens could be used for food. And then it was used for notebook prob uh, uh, programs for school. And then on and on and on. So from these bus tokens, Curitiba went from one of the most impoverished cities in the entire world, actually. Um, well, let me just give you a couple of the stats that happened over that 25-year period. Their GDP went up 48% higher than Paraná as a whole and 70% higher than the GDP of Brazil. They were the, the average Curitibano, um, by the end of this period, was making three times the minimum wage. And if you add the complementary currency programs onto that, it was another 30% higher still. And their ecological problems not only were resolved, but in 1990, the United Nations awarded Curitiba its highest environmental award in the world, all from these bus tokens. So I know that's a lot to take in. It's a lot for me to talk about. Um, but I want to I wanna also go over one other currency with you tonight and then open this up to discussion and, and conversation. Um, as I said earlier, these complementary currencies allow us to take this national currency system, which is this business currency system, and add on to it in a way that we're just adding different tools to a toolbox. They're called complementary currencies because they're not meant to replace our national currencies. Why would you want to get rid of our hammers? Especially those that have functioned so well in the business sector for such a long period of time. What you want to do is you want to add tools to the toolbox so that we have a full assortment of tools by which to resolve all of our issues, be they business or commercial or social or ecological concerns. And by the way, uh, you know, as long as we diddle daddy over you know, who's going to pay for the next bill down in Washington, and we keep arguing over that, when there's all these other resources, by the way, that they don't know about, but that's another story, but while we're, we're dealing with this taxation issue or the sequestration issue, we're not attending to some of the problems that are looming right in front of us and which demand our attention. This climate change, it's real. Every industrialized academy of science in the industrial world agrees with the findings of the IPCC. We are no longer at the beginning of it. We're well into this climate change. It's happening. But as long as we continue to debate over this finite amount of money, this national currency, when so many other currencies are there for us, and then people say, well, these, these complementary currencies, they're worthless. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> this thing right here, you know what it's backed by? It's backed by our belief that you can use it to get something for it. It's not backed by gold. It's not backed by silver. It's backed by nothing other than our beliefs. And beliefs are strong. There's a couple of people in the room I know that are working in belief systems right now. And <clears throat> but but these, this, this belief in our dollar, this belief in our national currency system, when we're beginning to learn that so much more is possible outside or alongside that national currency system, and when we see this dollar go up and down and up and down, and it's worth less and less over time, our belief begins to wane. That Notre Dame, that Chatra that were built, that were, were built a thousand years ago, 
that wasn't just a wonderful construction job. That was based on a very important element of civilization, trust. And our trust is waning. Back then, they devoted lifetimes to something that they would never even see the end product of. So it was devotion and trust in something greater than ourselves. And I contend that community and a vibrant middle class is essential for a civilization to prosper. I, I'm an historian buff, and I have yet to see a society that endured without taking care of its elders, its children, and the women having a second place in our society would have been unheard of a thousand years ago. So I want to just go over this one last currency with you. And I'd rather read a little bit of it because there's a number of figures and uh, I'm figured out. <laughs> um, the name of this currency is the Saber, which is the Portuguese word for knowledge. And this particular complementary currency initiative was developed in, in um, let's see, it was developed in collaboration with Professor Gilson Schwartz of the University of Sao Paulo, also in Brazil. And <clears throat> though it's intended specifically for education, um, this particular initiative allows us to understand how scarce, limited funding, national currencies, can be applied and leveraged to provide a much greater return for the buck or the complementary currency with regard to society's social needs. Okay? All right. So, <sighs> Brazil's institutions of higher learning um, are not functioning at full capacity. Um, inside the university classroom, you rarely see full attendance. This is in part caused by the fact that uh, it's related to the economic reality of Brazil with so many poor. And what happens is this. Though the economics of education is a very complex issue, um, when you have scarce resources applied to education, it limits our availability of educational tools, resources, and the personnel to help young people excel, especially those coming from poor neighborhoods. And in addition, um, those poor students, including those that want to excel, are limited in their own personal finance to be able to pay for their higher education. Yeah? So, <clears throat> in 1998, Brazil privatized its mobile telephone industry. And it introduced a 1% tax. This is one of the rare instances where we do use a tax for a complementary currency. But it introduced a 1% tax on this mobile telephone industry. By 2003, they had more than a billion dollars in this educational fund. And the question then became, um, how do I get the best bang for the billion? Yeah? So. Here in America and in other parts of the world, the conventional way of dealing with student loans, such as the American GI Bill, uh, which, which helps those who are veterans who are, have served in the military to get a student loan and to give them money individually for them to pay for their education. Well, what they decided to do in Brazil was to create a learning chain. And the learning chain allows a number of different students to benefit from the same initial amount of money. And this is how it operates. <clears throat> it starts at the primary schools. So first graders come to school and they're tutored by third graders and fourth graders. The third or fourth graders receive complementary currencies in the form of the saber, which they can then put away and use later on. And I'll go into that in a moment. So this goes on and on and on throughout grade school, throughout secondary school, high school, and when those that have gone through this entire system graduate, they have now accumulated 10, 15 years worth of complementary currencies. And these complementary currencies could then be used at the university level. If you're on an airplane 
and the plane is a third or a half full, that plane flies anyway. If you go to a movie theater and it's only a third fill, the film shows anyway, yeah? Well, in these universities where the classrooms are half filled, it still costs basically the same amount of money to pay for the professor, to pay for the facility, and to allow things to take place, yeah? So these students that otherwise would not get a college education, by the time they get out of high school with these sabers, they're given half of their tuition in university for free. The universities come out ahead, the students come out ahead, all of society comes out ahead. And then this billion dollars that was put into this fund doesn't actually even have to be touched. It's paid for with these complementary currencies in large part. So you just put the money aside just as a backing for what they're going to do. And again, these complementary currencies, they're backed by real world efforts, by people putting in their time, by people doing that. They're also backed by assets. So my question to everybody then becomes, why not make use of this? Here we are, people are fighting over a pittance of what our economy makes each year to pay for basic needs of the lower and middle class. Our middle class is nowhere near where it was 10 years ago. Remember what happened during the essential middle ages. As soon as that's that middle class, as soon as the feminine rights, as soon as things that we all care about, it seems, are infringed upon, it has a catalytic effect that can affect everything in our society. So thank you. And I will open this up to any questions you might have. Yes. Question, you, you talked about a, a tax levy if you hold on to the complementary currency. Who levies that tax? Well, doesn't that the, cause a centralized type government right there? No, in, in fact, during, during the central Middle Ages, um, the tax was called the seigneurage. And the seigneurage meant that the tax was levied when this, the, the lord of the region passed on. And as soon as he passed on, a new coin or a new currency was put in place with the face of the new lord. And since you didn't know when somebody was going to pass on, everybody was always concerned about holding on to the money for too long a period of time because they didn't want to get caught with the death of their lord and their taxing, being caught with the tax. It really was a hot potato back then. There were much more sophisticated ways to do that. Uh, they didn't wait for the Lord to die in Schwanenkirchen. Um, they didn't have time. It was only a two-year currency. But, but there are many sophisticated ways today to do what we did in the past and to do it even better. And, and another thing about the past was they didn't really understand what they were doing. This just happened as a natural expression of who they were and not understanding that money had this kind of industrial age mentality. They saw money very much the way it was denominated, in the, in the sense that they saw it as a gift from the great mother to nurture her children. And I'll just go back to that for one more moment, because there's another point I'd still like to make about that. We're talking about our environment today. We have this uh, industrial age obsolescence. You buy something, and a year later, you have to buy the next version of it. Well, <clears throat> these demoralized charge currencies, these local currencies, couldn't be saved. If you put it in the bank, it's going to cost you money, not make you money. So people did save back then, but they didn't save in currency. They saved in productive assets. And this is important. So what they would do every year is renew their windmills, take care of their land, their tools, and take care of their community, beautify it. Another way to see these currencies is, is as a feminine counterpart to these patriarchal currencies that we use for industry. So people would save, but they would save in productive assets. And they would save in hundreds of years of planning for future generations of welfare by the building of these cathedrals. So here we are today, and we're all consumed by next quarter profits when we need to start thinking about long-term consequences about what we're doing. And instead, we're eating up our resources, eating up one another, fighting over things that 
literally, we do not need to be fighting over. There's so much abundance available to us in this world if we start understanding what's really at stake. And one other thing about this, uh, I told you what the word money comes from. Well, the other word that we use is currency. Yeah? And currency comes from the word currents or corrente. And it means the flow of energy. These names didn't come into being by mistake. The way others used to see money was that it was a flow of energy. And these demurrage charge currencies are exactly that. Instead, we have this money where hmm, it goes in my pocket. I'm the one. It's all mine. It's all mine. That's not the way civilization works. Not a healthy one. Um, real quick, just to clarify too, with demurrage, no money is being exchanged. There's, there's no money uh, you know, being put to the central government or anything like that. It's just the money loses its value. Okay. So, it's not really tax, uh, just it, it's, it's basically being taken away from you by a government. But it's if not at a specific time. It loses its. But you, value. you look at the benefits versus the rewards. The rewards is you, you get a flow. Of, people aren't hoarding their money, and you get more activity right, no, in the community. The velocity of money creates right more. Uh, um, can you talk about the fear of kipu? The Furie kipu. Yes, the Furie kipu is um, another social currency from Japan. And by the way, the uh, single country that has the most complementary currency initiatives in the world today is Japan. They've been experimenting since the mid-90s. And in fact, after World War II, most complementary currencies disappeared from, from the face of the earth. And they started coming back in, beginning with Japan, through the efforts of one single woman, again, um, that, that brought together a complementary currency. And one of the latest complementary currencies is uh, Caring health ticket called Furie Kipu. And so uh, two thirds of the people living in the world today, over the age of 65, um, this is more than all of the people that lived 65 ever in history combined. We have an age wave that is unprecedented, and the country that has the greatest percentage of, of elders in their country is Japan. And so in 1991, they realized, well, this is a, it's a fortune to keep paying for health care for, for elders, especially when a lot of the time what they needed was not necessarily interventions or surgeries, but more minor care. And also, um, the national health system doesn't allow for a number of services that the elderly need, like shopping. And uh, another very important uh, ceremonial rite in Japan is the proper bathing and showering, which sometimes needs the help of another assistant. So what they did was um, men and women who are health care uh, givers, who had extra time, and especially those who had elders living in other parts of the country, and I'll go into that in a moment, they started creating these health care tickets where the providers would come to the home rather than having the patient have to go to the hospital for minor, and minor uh, needs. And <clears throat> What happened was that the, uh, the recipients, the elders who received this care, preferred this type of care about 98% uh, to having to go to these institutionalized hospitals. The cost is far less. And those giving the care can then use these tickets for their own parents who might be living in other parts of the country so that they could receive care. So you save so much money. It's a much more personalized way of of dealing with health care. And to me, it makes perfect sense. And I think to the Japanese, it's starting to make perfect sense as well. And again, we have all of these wonderful tools that hurt nobody and help our society. Just uh, one of the other sides about the Swedish implementation of the Fury of Kipu. Um, but there, just because, I mean, the Japanese are very much, uh, you know, they really care for their elderly, it's very much a strong social um, part of their culture. And apparently what I heard from Bernard um, last fall or something um, was that they tried to implement the Fury Kipu in Sweden and it didn't work nearly as well. And one of the reasons why is that just it seems like, you know, a lot of Western culture doesn't have a strong tendency to take care of our elderly and that's something we need to work on and the, the currency failed there, um, is my understanding. Which brings back to one of the basic points about money. 
and it may be hard to understand this because of the title, but uh, I wish there were a better way to explain this, but the, uh, the money itself is not value neutral. It's not some exogenous thing that's basically without value to it. Look at back again at the central Middle Ages. Okay? That complementary currency, that local currency, induced an entire behavior pattern. And again, we know that you know, when, when the currency went away, so did the values that went along with it go away. Okay? Cooperation, caring for a community, caring for one another, the beautification of our environments. All of that seems to be connected with these local currencies, not only in the Central Middle Ages, not only in dynastic Egypt, but in many other places. Still ongoing today in some form in Bali. That's, that has the oldest local currency in the world. It's over 1,000 years old. And the same traits, again. Um, so these, the, our money is not value neutral. Each type of money that we use induces different type of behavior patterns. If it's a positive interest rate, it's going to absolutely create competition. Whereas these negative interest uh, currencies seem to create cooperation. And you know, when people ask, well, which one's better? They're not better. They're both necessary. We have these masculine and feminine parts to each of us and to society. When either side is out of balance, society is out of balance. And for the last 300 years, we've been doing the same thing over and over again. And then psychologists look at what our behavior is for the last 300 years, and they say, well, that's human behavior. Greed, fear of scarcity is human behavior. It's just part of who we are. Actually, history tells us another story. When you change the monetary system and you create something that has these demurrage charges, well, then human behavior seems to be something quite different, cooperative, caring, helping one another. So I don't have an answer, but I have a big question about who we really are. And I'd love to have a new experiment trying these other currencies out and seeing if we're not more humane than what people are telling us. Yes. So I'm, I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to try this all on for size. I completely um, align with what you're saying. The values, what we're doing isn't making sense. And, and so I'm trying to walk this whole thing into my life and also into Boulder. So if I think about Boulder for a minute, this is probably a city that could it pretty much embrace and maybe do an experimental thing. Um, oh, maybe we already are. We already are. Okay, so where have I been? But, you know, okay, all right, good. So That's I'm, this forum is here. Okay, great. Because very few people have heard about it. Well, that, that, and I'm one of them that hasn't heard about no. it. So, and it so, so there's that, and then there's also, like, this, <coughs> this week, I'm thinking what, I have to hire somebody to trim a tree, I need some PowerPoint slides done, and I probably need some other things. And I would love to think about how to approach it differently, and I suspect that they would like me to pay them in dollars. Uh, maybe, not, I don't know, but I'm really open to what can I do and do differently, you know, to, to maybe start a ripple effect. And I, I respect that there's, there are things going on that I don't know about in Boulder also. Maybe it's plugging into those things. Yeah, there, there is a, something called Skillshare Network. Very 170 sure. members in Boulder alone. And about 7,000 hours have been exchanging. And they are, it's all managed by a free software that many of our time banks are using all around the United States, and there have been half a million hours exchanged between people, just for time, with their skills. And it's amazing. Yes, you do with each skill share. share that great. And there are complementary currencies all over the world. Wonderful. And, and in the US, we have thousands. But I, I'd like to, everything that Veronique just said is true, and there is another element to all of this that I think you're beginning to touch upon. And it's an important one. And I don't have a full answer for it. But we human beings seem to be uh, addicted in some ways to suffering. And it's only through suffering that sometimes we learn 
some of these things that need to happen. And most of the cases whereby these monetary changes, transformations take place, not all the time, but in many cases we wait until the last minute or until after the last minute to implement these changes because we no longer have uh, the luxury of waiting any longer. Yeah? And that's part of the reason we, we did so much work on the Central Middle Ages and a few other pieces to try to convey the fact that we're very close to that golden age or catastrophe. We really are. You know, just the climate change alone. And again, we're not addressing it. We keep talking about it, we keep arguing over it, but we're really not doing what needs to get done. And so are we going to wait until the last minute or after the last minute? So I don't know. It's really up to everybody else. It's up to people getting together, talking about this. But I believe, and I've yet to see something that contrasts with that belief, that until and unless we bring consciousness to money, I mean, here we are in this monetized world. Mm -hmm. It would seem to me, and I'm, I'm one of the people who knew nothing about money for a very long time, but in a monetized world, I think it's to everybody's benefit to learn as much as we can about money. You know, if you lived in a, a period where they use swords, you want to learn about swords. Mm -hmm. Well, we live in this monetized world where virtually everything we do and depend upon including many people's survivals, nation's survivals, depends on money. But we're not really, it's like a, what was the, uh, what was it President Obama said yesterday, combining Star Trek and uh, Star Wars, but it's kind of this mind melt, and it really is a phenomenon. It's like fish who live in the water. It's so ever-present in our lives that we really don't stop to think about it. We take it for granted until it bites us. And it's been biting us harder and harder. The poverty in this world, the disparity of wealth, the unemployment, the economic instability, the way women suffer around the world, and it all has some connection to this money system, this patriarchal money system. So I know on the flyer it talks about uh, that I'll be talking about women and poverty. <coughs> I'm really talking about feminine and poverty. And bringing that, it's just not enough for me that people can actually elect today a woman as a senator. We need a monetary system that reflects all of our values, our yin values, our yang values, all of it. We need a full assortment of monetary tools. Eric? I heard Obama recently, maybe it was the inauguration speech, and him say that there are 70,000 bridges that need to get fixed. Never mind the water systems, never mm -hmm. mind all the other stuff. Could we get all those bridges fixed using complementary currencies? My answer to that, and I'm going to sound like a fanatic, and maybe I am, uh, but truly, I believe that we can put the entire world back to work. Everybody. They did this before. Why can't we do it today? Those who don't want to work, that's another story. But those that are willing to work, if you have these tools available to you, why can we not create full employment around the world? Again, there's all this work needing to get done. There's all these workers. We just need something that people can accept as a form of money to allow this medium of exchange to be utilized. Yes? But how is that money backed? What are the assets behind it? I'm not understanding the word currency when you say complementing currency. I get the skills share change because that's bartering. No. Well, it, it could be barter. I'm just deducing. <coughs> I don't know anything about what's going on here in Boulder. But what I'm trying to understand is how is this currency backed? So there's not one currency. No, the complementary currency. No, I'm saying there's not one complementary currency. There's an un ending slew of complementary currencies available to us. They could be backed by nothing more than the same thing that backs our dollar, a belief. They can be backed by an hour of time that people agree to. You know, what is money? Money is an agreement to use something. It's an agreement to use something either as a store of value, a medium of exchange, 
one or more different things, but it's basically an agreement. That really is what money is about. Someone Hold on. Has to give you something for that right. time. So let's go back to the bridges analogy here. Okay. This gentleman just brought up. So okay. you now need to have a bunch of skilled workers yeah. to build the bridge. Okay. So whatever the currency is underlying this exchange, so that these people are willing to put in the labor and time and effort to build these bridges, they need to get something in return. Yes. And if that something is food, or that something is shelter, or that something is yes. whatever, I mean, how do they get that? Because somebody else is willing to give them that because they want the bridge? Well, yeah, you yeah. Be that, yeah. if you're talking about one particular thing versus another one particular thing, then you are talking about barter. The problem with barter is that you need a double coincidence of wants. If you have vodka sure. and I have Pepsi-Cola right. and I don't want your vodka, we're not doing any deals today. <laughs> Money is different. Money is, is a far more sophisticated mechanism. I give you a dollar and you may not use it in my store, you may not use it for this thing, you could use it for many other things, yes? Okay. So if you have a community like Detroit that basically, that basically has so many unemployed people with skills. You have a hairdresser here, you have a mechanic there, you have a painter over there, and you have a bridge builder over here, okay? And you have farmers that are growing food and they can't, use, they can't sell the food because there's no local economy. So you have all of these people with different needs and different resources. Money is about matching up needs and resources. So if you can put a wider selection of people together, each with different skills, sooner or later people are going to be buying from one another. This is exactly what they do with time dollars. Um, it's somewhat what they do with uh, let's local exchange uh, trade systems. And it's what they do with thousands of other complementary currencies around the world. But I want to go back to one other point that she made and that you're inferring, I believe. <clears throat> we have been in this mind melt for a long time. And so here we are, the sophisticated postmodern society trying to figure out what pre-modern societies had already figured out. Not because they were smarter than we are, but because we've been in this single paradigm for so long, it really is not easy to move out beyond that. This really is this collective yuck that's upon us, and we you know, I've been to societies where in Bali, where it's still unbelievable to me. What the ancients used to do was they had all these Chinese coins. Um, and there were too many of them. So what they would do is they say, well, I want that. They'd pick up a handful of it. Not that it had any real value, because they had it as well. But they'd pick it up ceremoniously, give it to the next person. They'd say, thank you. And then they'd give them what they wanted. The money actually had no real value to it but they had a different mindset about money. And again, they had this connection about money to something, some greater power. And they understood that we're all here together and that we need to help one another, not just compete with one another. Healthy competition is wonderful, but we also need some cooperation. And with regard to money, it will take a little bit of rethinking. There's no question about that. But boy, when you go to a, a community in need and you tell them that there's something available for them to be able to get their needs met, they don't question it. They just go for it. So again, the question becomes, are we going to wait until that period comes here in the United States? And I think it's coming quicker than not if we continue on our ways, whereby it's the suffering that creates a new mind think on our part. Or do we begin to engage in this now? Sure person <laughs> well, I have a question. So, you know, in Germany, where the, the, that local one city was able to overcome yeah, the depression, that sort of works on a wonderful level when you all start bartering or swapping in a local economy that can sustain itself. It can grow its own food and there's enough to feed everyone there. When you start extrapolating that to sort of now we probably and maybe Boulder is a little bit different, but can't, can't grow enough food to barter or exchange. Do you see this being applicable to a 
United States, like that large of a system, and where do the barter cross with actual currency? Well, because at some point, someone wants real money. The banks want real money. So where do those two systems cross? For most of human existence, we didn't have banks. Yeah. Banks. But the banks now don't want to go away. So the banks may not want to go away, but we sort of ignored them. A new alternate currency. We ignored it. Yeah. I started writing this book with Bernard in late 2000. We thought it was going to take two or three years. In fact, I'm, I'm so delighted that we're having the uh, first outreach for the book right here in Boulder Library. I spent two years upstairs. Uh, doing research, not knowing if this ever actually would become a book. And it almost didn't, but that's another story. Um, <clears throat> look, I spent a few years asking that very question. And the questions that you're asking and you're asking and that others are inferring, I've gone through this myself. It wasn't like this thing came to me overnight and I went right on. Okay, I grew up, um, one of my first jobs was working with, I shouldn't say this, but working with... Um, uh, an institution very close to Wall Street. And <laughs> so I got to see what some people today are calling the underbelly. But let me go into this for a moment. When we started writing this book, uh, it was about several months after President, then President Clinton and Vice President Gore gave their State of the Union address and the economy was zoop, right? I mean, there was no end to the internet and no end to anything, all right? It seemed like the economy was going to go on forever. And then, bust. And 11, 12 years ago, there was a small minority of people that were kind of upset with the banking system and the way they were doing things, but it wasn't very many people. And there was a lot that wasn't known then that we know now. And in this last decade alone, the change in attitude, this change in perception, and the change in reality in our world is such that more and more people are beginning to look at this banking system and saying there needs to be an adjustment. There needs to be some people called accountable for some of what went wrong. But again, understand that so much of what's taking place is really about the end of an entire age. We are literally coming out of the industrial age and every time an age ends and another one begins, it is not easy. And we need to adjust our thinking and just adjust our behaviors and adjust our systems to reflect what all of us need now and what this, the living systems of this planet need. So whether we get it overnight or not, I don't think we have a choice but to, to begin looking at and utilizing these other tools that are available to us. But how did the two systems coexist in the past? Because you said that there were both currencies operating at the same time. Well, not only both currencies, but a, a great deal of barter. Okay? You can have different things happening at the same time. Okay? You can have local exchanges with barter as well. Again, as long as you have, you know, two sides matching up, you could do barter. One of the biggest things going on today is a thing called counter trade with these large businesses around the world. And it's nothing more than barter. Okay, so we still have barter, we still have that going on. But the predominance of all of our human activities today are actually based on the use of these national currencies. Okay, so I, again, I'm not saying that there's not an educational process. What I am saying is we can either learn and learn quickly or we'll learn anyway when we have to. Shana, you had asked, wanted to ask a question. I'm sorry. I feel like you're giving us a philosophical overview, which I'm really interested in, and I think a lot of people in this room agree with. But then there's this other piece, which I don't feel like you're helping us out with, which is, OK, assuming you know we're all on board, or a lot of people will be on board, and there's not really an invitation coming from you, and maybe this isn't your job yet, of some kind of an experiment or some kind of real examples in terms of Boulder 
we live here. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. how could this come into being? Just, you know, you're creating an invitation, but then you're not telling us where the party is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right in part. Now, I don't mean to sound defensive about it, but I feel that my particular skill sets, or whatever you want to call it, are best left right now to the communications around this. Everything begins with communication, to me. So my job over the next year or two uh, is to communicate about this and to not have uh, myself involved directly with too many local currencies because I've been asked by hundreds of communities already to do that and I'm one person. So what I'm asking in return um, is that you read about this material, that you begin to understand it. I am perfectly happy and actually we tried eight years ago when Bernard and I were here in town writing together, we tried to get a complementary currency going with the uh, local government. But it was stalled by one thing or another. People didn't understand it, which is why we started to really get serious about writing this book so that we could hand that out to people to have them begin to digest what this is all about. And once that is done, we're perfectly happy to come in. And I'd love to see a complementary currency started either here in Boulder or in Colorado. But I am also, you know, at this stage of the game for me, it's not that small is beautiful alone. We have some very large issues that are affecting us on a global basis. And I feel that my own particular talents would be best left to doing something on a national or international level because that's the type of impact we need to have pretty quickly. Look at this NGO movement. They spend anywhere from 30 to 80 percent of their time raising money so they can go do their post-industrial work and they, they're vying for this industrial age currency to allow them to do post-industrial work. It doesn't work. It will never happen the way people think it would. You could have a multi-billionaire tomorrow give all his money away to a couple of different NGOs but the other hundreds of thousands or several million of them are still left asking for money to do the work that needs to get done. So when people ask me to get involved in a local currency, I answer, are you serious? Have you read the material? Are you doing your own homework? I'll be glad to come in, especially here in Boulder. Show me that you're serious and we'll create something. Otherwise, my own particular uh, calling at this moment is to create something globally. I should mention that I am working on one local complementary currency, but it's not here. It's in Thailand. And I call it the Pontip currency. Pontip is a Thai word for the daughter of Buddha. And I'd like to go into that for a moment, because it's an example of what's taking place all over the world. Um, many of the women working in Thai massage parlors in Thailand are actually devout Buddhists, and I know many of them. Uh, I've worked with them uh, along this currency th thing, and they are devout Buddhists, almost all of whom have extended families and villages, mostly from the north in Isan, where there are these rice paddies. Well, about 40 years ago, these rice paddies that before then were barter relationships became monetized. The Americans started coming in from Vietnam, and it was an R&R &R for them, and more and more became monetized. And so all of a sudden, these lands that they had for hundreds, if not thousands of years, they had to start getting money in the form of Thai baht to pay for it. Well, if you're a farmer, what do you do? So a lot of the women turn to Thai massage. And Thai massage is a very sacred uh, practice among Buddhists in Thailand. And then they needed more money and more money. And then the tourists were only coming part of the year and not coming the other part of the year. What do these women who are now stuck in the South, who are Thai massage therapists, what do they do to earn money? And a lot of them have had to turn to either marrying a foreigner or to prostitution. And then they go away after this period where the tourists leave. I've been with them. They go back to a, a, a Buddhist temple and they pray for forgiveness for what they just did to take care of their families. 
So one of the projects that's very dear to my heart is a Fourier Kipu system in Thailand, whereby these Thai massage therapists, when the foreigners aren't there, could then go and volunteer their time to a hospital or to whatever, get a ticket. That ticket could be transferred to their elders up in northern Isan, and they can be taken care of. So they're actually making a form of money and not having to do things that are against their value system. I'd love to do something like that here in the United States uh, for the young people especially and for all those people graduating from college who don't have a job after four or five years of hard work. We can create many different things and we are, we're fortunate to have people in, in uh, Washington who actually really understand the need for the middle class to get the help that they need, but they don't have the tools to do it. So, and I mean this, for me to get involved in a local currency, I'll be happy to do it. Show me the interest, and I'll be glad to show up and give what time I can. And I would like to answer your question. He looks at the big picture, as you mentioned. But there are tons of information on the web for, the, for local initiatives. And one great uh, website is complementarycurrency.org. And then you see all the initiatives, or quite a few. And you can really dig in lots of information on the subject, practical. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And here at Boulder, Skillshare Network. Did you say practical? Yeah. No. Yeah. I have a question that's sort of two different parts for me in my head. Um, but it seems like one of the things um, in common with a lot of these complementary currencies is that there's a group of people or a person who has a lot of charisma or stake um, in the community, and that tends to sort of push it forward, and then also relies on sort of systems that are already set up in place and using those to mm -hmm. manipulate and move the currency along lines that are kind of already there, like the bus system or like the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of accurate or necessary or kind of a, a skeleton of how that happens or just happens to be some of the examples you're talking about? Well, again, there are many different, I mean, there's thousands of examples and there's no one size fits all answer to that. Look, you can go on the websites tomorrow of Time Bank or Time Dollars or the Let System. They have something already set up that you could plug into. And they have thousands or hundreds of communities around the world that you could plug into. It doesn't have to be local here. We have the internet. You could be doing skill shares with people all over the country and, in fact, all over the world. Okay? You know, but my, again, my job is to, at this moment, to impart information and to encourage people to think about this, to read about it, and to really begin to ask themselves. I mean, you know, I, I, I graduated, or I began university in the 1960s. And back then, I remember we had, a, we had a debate. And the debate was about whether the women should be allowed in the universities, given that they were all going to become wives, and there were, no one's going to have a job. This is 50 years ago in this country. Look how far we've come. As a child, I traveled from New York down to Florida. We stopped off in one of the southern states, and there was the bathroom problem. Okay? I mean, change is happening so quickly in our world. It's hard to keep up with it. And I think a lot of that change is for the better. And I, again, I'm just going to say it. We need these tools. And yes, it's going to be a little bit of a, an uncomfortable first passes for some, to understand this, uh, that's part of the reason we wrote the book the way we did. This is intended for the general audience, not just for some people in academia. It was for, intended for everybody to begin to think consciously about this. And I think the change can happen very quickly. I'm still optimistic that either this administration or the next administration is going to have to turn to complementary currencies to address the problems of our age. We can't keep doing this and expect, you know, even if we were able to resolve these political issues between the left and the right tomorrow morning, and even if we had, you know, these multi-billionaires saying, we want to give more to this economy. We're going to voluntarily increase our, our, our taxation to the levels that they had during uh, President Eisenhower. If you had all of this new tax money available to you, 
things would be better. But I promise you, we can never, ever fly the way the promise of this age offers us. Again, you can have all of the national currencies available. You're still dealing with I'm not making this up. It's not just a metaphor. It literally is the form of a hammer. It will not allow. I mean, we spend a good third of the book talking about uh, values and the value non-neutrality of money. This thing will only allow you to do certain things. Our national currencies will only allow certain things to happen. There's no mistake why education, ecological needs, caring for the elders has so much more difficulty than getting a business up and running. It's, it's not by mistake. These are business currencies. And we keep trying to use it to do social and ecological needs. And in fact, even our business needs. We can't meet all of our business needs with these business currencies. They'll allow for certain things and not others. So, yes. Uh, quick question. Uh, one of the themes that I can hear from everybody, including myself, is, is execution. Yes. How you can take the idea and actually implement it in the real world. Yes. Do they have, is there documentation from back in the, the medieval times when they had those um, countries and they had all that going on, or Germany? Do they have documentation of how no. they actually No, they don't. That? They don't. There's nothing. They don't. Um, I realize, I mean, I hear it too, wherever I go. Well, how do we do this? I would suggest that if you really want to do this, start with the Time Dollars or the Let's websites. Play with that a little bit. You can get a lot done with these, these currencies. Play with what? Uh, the, time, the Time Bank. It's one, it's, it was created by Edgar Kahn. Um, and it's in many places around the world. And you can give an hour of time and get back an hour of, 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 of time back from different groups or different people. And you can play with this to begin to get an idea of how this all operates. And then if there is a particular need that's not getting met in a community uh, of a certain amount of importance, you know, there are people that you can call on. There are, there are these services. And again, I'd be happy and Bernard would be happy either by email or whatever, it's so simple. This is not really a problem. It's hard to understand it, but it's actually not hard to implement it. Yes? I'm, I'm actually very interested in what you've said, and I'm very interested in symbolism. Mm -hmm. And I'm half Canadian, half American, and it's a very practical thing they did. I just came back from Canada. They eliminated the penny. Yeah. They really have there is no stuff. paper money. One, one dollar or two dollar. The images on those coins are loons, and all the other images on the bills are feminine. You've spoken of symbols. I mean, there is a really, in my opinion, practical, but I'd like to hear from you about what you think about how imagery and symbols works, because you've spoken a lot about the feminine tonight, and I'm interested in your comment. Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell. Need I say more? <laughs> Joseph Campbell uh, spent his life talking about the power of myth. And myth is not some unimportant, inconsequential thing. Myth is the way ancient civilizations talked about what's real to them, what's important in life, and how a culture defines itself. So for the last 300 years, actually for the last 700 years, We've had this patriarchal system. And, and I'm not making it up. It's not a bolder attitude. It's, it's reality. We've had this patriarchal system in play. And when our industrial age currencies came into play, they were still burning witches at the stake. Okay? It was that type of Victorian mindset that gets embodied in our systems, and not just our money system. And so these symbols that you speak of are, to me, vitally important. And they speak volumes about who we are and what we can achieve, what's possible and what's not possible. And I tell you, every time I look at history, I did not start off trying to prove this point. It kind of forced itself into my being because it was everywhere I looked and everywhere Bernard looked. Whenever there's a society with an unhealthy or an out-of-balance 
patriarchy that's superimposing itself on all of our systems, sooner or later, that warrior type mentality by itself, if it's not balanced out with these feminine values, creates self-destruction. So to me, it's not symbol anymore. It's reality. And we should wake up to that because we all benefit. Everybody benefits by that balance. So much more becomes possible than what we have now. And I'm not saying that we have to get rid of business. I'm not saying that you have to you know, get rid of the wealthy. Just the opposite. By having that balance, we're actually protecting the wealth and the abundance that our world has created over the last three, 400 years. Otherwise, we are headed towards self-destruction, I think. And history says. Yes? I, I believe I mentioned they eliminated penny in Canada. Yes. Uh, there, there is a great symbol right there. Is take care of the lesser and the greater will take care of itself. So. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to have, there's been a number of questions about engagement. And as someone who, you know, I've been working on with you on this for the last decade or so. And um, I thought about this a lot. And, um, and something I think, one, it's about engagement, it's about getting involved in the local Skillshare communities and putting in hours, most importantly. I mean, understanding the theory and the rest of it is something, but having it so that it's a community coming together. Um, I just came back from Australia, and uh, there is this awesome, um, just alternative energy permaculture-based community, and they actually had a Let's Caboose, um, where people could come, and you could come and you could learn about it. But the thing is, is that this is so, um, not unknown, especially in the United States. Um, and it's just, we need to go and we need to actually execute understanding about this. I've seen people just blown away with how powerful this is, because it is so powerful. This is us being fish getting out of the water in which we swim. And it's, it's amazing and it's mind boggling and I'm learning more about it every single day. Um, Sacred Economics is also a really good book that I recommend to everybody right about now. Um, but my big takeaway from Australia um, is permaculture. And the, a part of the permaculture design manual has the let system actually as a part of it. And that a part of what a complementary currency is and what it does is it's pulling together a bioregion. A lot of people think about permaculture as a method of farming and how to use your own space to your advantage, but yes, it is, and to a, a bigger extent, and to a meta extent. And it's just so important to understand that we're going to have to start to do this stuff. The way that we farm this country is going to change in the next hundred years. Like, it's just, you know, when the price of oil gets to a certain point, we're going to need to feed each other. And the thing is, and we do need to take care of our elderly. And right now, you know, <coughs> baby boomers, you know, vastly unprepared for retirement is an understatement. And so we're going to have to come together as a community and as a total community. And these, these, commu these complementary currencies are how they happen. And Bernard and Stephen are not the people who should be coming in here and who should be doing this stuff. There's a bunch of rules and tenets that I have around money and that I work with, with, with Bernard, Stephen, and my dad. But when no one is in charge, everybody's in charge. This is, this is stuff that we have to figure out. These are survival skills. And there's just no two ways about it. And... Um, Money is what money does. You know, how to answer that, you know, so hard, such a hard question about, you know, how do you, what, what backs a currency? Nothing has ever backed a currency other than the willingness to do work for something and to go and take what you're given and then go and make your life with, with what you exchange it for. And, you know, a number of the complementary currencies are also backed by a number of assets. Again, you know, it's not so much the backing. The real bottleneck here is one, appreciating that these things exist, and then fine-tuning ourselves to adapting to these new currencies. You know, I, I know it's going to take a little bit of understanding, but I, I hope and I believe that the book will go a long way in explaining the things that I can only begin to touch upon in a 45-minute conversation. Yes? I started out life as a medical anthropologist long ago. And, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things I hear over and over again here and, and what strikes me is that really maybe what we're talking about to a great extent is the difference between, you know, inductive and reductive paradigms or, or qualitative and quantitative thought. Uh, I work with primitive cultures mostly and, and their worldview and paradigm is qualitative, it's, it's inductive, mm -hmm. and 
you know, that is pretty much the feminine, really, compared to, you know, like masculine paradigms. But getting a large mass of people to actually have a cultural paradigm shift, which is essentially what you're talking about here. I mean, not that I don't mm -hmm. like what I'm hearing. I'm, I'm just like, wow, that's, I mean, that makes going to the moon or a manned mission to Mars look easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 you, you know. And so how, you know, how, how do you present this in a way, or can you speak to a way to, to because so many people in our culture, even if they understand what qualitative or inductive means are just straight out incapable of employing those tools. Well, there's well, a huge we'll movement on. that encompasses complementary currency and it's called the transition network, especially in the UK and in Europe. And you know, people have realized we can afford to buy things from across the globe because it's, it's not sustainable and the price of oil is too expensive. So the whole idea is to create an, a local economy with producing goods, utilizing goods, utilizing complementary currency. And it, I was fascinated. I was like you, a little bit skeptical. But oh, it's not that I'm skeptical. It, I mean, my, my, because I've, I've lived with people who think and, and are qualitative in, but in their world. Yeah. Yeah. But they but, I mean, it took me the better part of 15 years of college to learn how to think qualitatively and, and, and inductively. It's not a simple thing. I mean, like, even if you take very simple tenets, like, like the four main principles involved in magic, right? That seems, like, kind of out there. But, but you can create a belief system in a world which actually functions and works with that and has value if you can shift your thought paradigm. So, um, and wouldn't you also say that capitalism is inherently reductive and, and reductive and, and breeds that kind of thought? I mean, to me, capitalism and, and maybe to some extent Christianity is like our paradigms that work well for merchants. I'm in enough trouble with money. I'm not going to Christianity. I'm not going. <laughs> Keep me out of that. What I will say is this. Here's what I would say. And what I'm going to say will sound heretical to people here in Boulder, because so much of what um, the energy is here is about becoming more conscious, OK? Mm -hmm. And that, that's not an unimportant thing. It's, I think, probably the most important thing we human beings can do during our lifetime. But I'm going to say something that may sound, at first, unethical. But my passion over the last 40, 45 years, following a near-death experience, has been around uh, whole systems transformation. And the reason I'm so passionate about that, I've been trying all my life to get enlightened. Friends of mine say, stay in the now, stay in the now, stay in the now. And then I got the... Perfect. So let me, let me just finish this thought because I think it's important yeah. to leave it here. Uh, we talk about consciousness and we talk about belief systems and we talk about all of these things that we believe to be interior dimensions alone. But as James Hillman, one of the fathers of archetypal, or one of the pioneers, don't say father, um, one of the pioneers of archetypal psychology told us, it's not all about what happens in here. It's not all about our parents. It's not all about this or that interiorly. It's also about this exterior framework that keeps impounding itself upon who we are. So keep that in mind. And so what I'm going to say to you is this. As far as we could tell, and I'm not saying we, we own this, but, but as far as we could tell, putting systems in place actually creates its own consciousness. So if you put in place a demurrage charge system, this guy could be from, you know, he could be a hunter and he's got all of these other values. But the next day, all of a sudden, he's cooperating with his next door neighbor. He can't figure it out, but he's cooperating with them. So these systems impact upon our values. When I said earlier 
that money is not value neutral. I'm not making that up. Oh, I, I, I totally agree with you. So what we do is we have, and again, somebody, I don't know if it was you or somebody else who said that, uh, well, I may not want to choose to live that way. But what I'm talking about is choice. I'm saying that right now we don't have the choice. Right now, you're either in, inside this industrial matrix or good luck to you. Yeah. And what I'm saying is, wait a minute, that may be pro proper for some people. It may not be proper for others. So when you have more and more tools available to you, you have more and more choices. And so if somebody wants to live in the industrial model, fine. I have no problem with that. But allow me to either be involved in agriculture or post-industrial or whatever I want and have the tools so that I can go and do that. Right now, it's very hard to do. Uh, it, it's tough. I personally loathe the reductive paradigm, but I'm stuck here. And... I'm being told by a friend to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but our time is up. New Money for New World, I hope you have had a good evening. Thank you. This is important, very, very important. During this period also, the women had a freedom that we have not seen since or before. Even today in most countries around the world, people do not, the women, do not have the same rights available to them that they had back then. Women were involved in most of the major professions. They were in political leaderships. Um, they had these double monasteries with men and women. But the person in charge of these double monasteries was not the abbot. It was the abbess. Uh, women were landowners. Women participated in almost every aspect of society. So this golden age comes to an end. And history teaches us that the great plague that took place in the mid-1300s and which endured for about 120 to 150 years and decimated between a third and a half of Europe's population. Um, this period, according to historians, just kind of happened. It's an exogenous event that just came about in and of its own, destroyed this culture, and then you have, what? Whatever came next. We now know that this great plague was preceded by about 50 or 60 years of economic upheaval, comparable to our Great Depression and our Great Recession and a few other things. What happened was, in about 1265, uh, King Louis IX, I believe, he uh, became a more of an authoritarian figure, centralized power. And when he did so, he also centralized the money system. And he got rid of these complementary currencies. This was followed in 1295 uh, by another contraction that took place with another king from France. And these two monetary events took this 250-year period into upheaval. And so for the next 50 or 60 years, you had famines, you had all sorts of things breaking out. Uh, society is in major destruction mode. And by the time 1347 came about, the Great Plague came into being because the environment for 50 or 60 years allowed for that. So when we think today of sequestration and some of the rancor that goes on in our political debate, the misogyny, and you start I first want to express my gratitude to Boulder Reach for the work that they're doing in the world and for making this evening possible, and also to Veronique Foster and Tom Foster for all their help in making this happen. So as we begin in the book, humanity is at a critical juncture. We have so many good things happening, the achievements that have been wrought over the last several decades in particular offer hope of a vast renewal 
and perhaps even a golden age for society. On the other hand, we have a constellation of seemingly insurmountable critical issues that threaten us perhaps as never before. So the question then becomes, how do we get to that golden age? How do we resolve these critical issues? So I'd like to first talk tonight about tools. Tools are things that make, facilitate things, make things happen. And I brought a special toolbox with me tonight to illustrate a key point. <clears throat> Let me just open this up. Yes. So inside this toolbox, we have a hammer. We also have another hammer. <laughs> and surprise, surprise, another hammer. This, if I could find it, <clears throat> is a US dollar bill. This is a 10 euro note. Now these two bills have different motifs, different colors, different nations, actually multiple nations of origin, but they're both national currencies. And just like the Japanese yen and the Mexican peso and all of the other national currencies in our world, they are all bank debt, interest bearing fiat currencies. They are the monetary equivalent of a hammer. They're all the same type of currency. <clears throat> so just as it takes a number of tools to build a house, it takes many different monetary tools to build a global economy. And not just a global economy. We're using the equivalent of a hammer, a monetary hammer, to try to ad address our social issues that was anything but dark. There was a prosperity that we can only envy at today. There was a wealthy higher class, upper class, and then there was a vast, vibrant middle class. In fact, there's little evidence whatsoever of any significant poverty for that entire 250 year period. There was work for all with very favorable working conditions. Um, <clears throat> Sunday was the day of the Lord. Monday was the blue Monday set aside for uh, private matters. In addition, they had from 90 to as many as 170 official holidays each year. There was uh, three to four meals a day, three to four courses for lunch and dinner, whereas daily caloric intake today averages about 3,000 calories in developed countries. Back then, the daily caloric intake was 3,500 to 4,000 calories per day. Uh, the arts flourished. Uh, industry that is thought to have begun with the Industrial Revolution actually started hundreds of years earlier during this period. Um, there was work, as I said, for all. And this age is now being called uh, by historians the first modernization the true European takeoff, and the first true renaissance. Uh, the university system thought to have, uh, happening, uh, thought to have taken place during the uh, renaissance actually started hundreds of years earlier during this period. Uh, abstract sciences, such as mathematics, uh, took place during this period as well. It's also been called the age of cathedrals. As this period, this 250 year period, is considered by historians to be the greatest period of construction the world, or at least the Western world, has ever known. All of the great cathedrals, almost all of the great cathedrals of Western Europe were built during this time. And we know these today. They're still standing and, and functioning today. Notre Dame, Chartres, and, and most of the other great cathedrals. And if anybody's ever been there, you know of the craftsmanship that went into this. Uh, I have seen very little in modern, modern times to compare to these edifices. So these cathedrals in particular bring up an interesting question. These cathedrals took hundreds, sometimes hundreds of years, definitely generations to build. And interestingly, 
And in contrast to what we think today, that those churches, those monasteries, those cathedrals were not built by the church. They were not paid for by the church. They were actually built and paid for by that vibrant middle class. And it took tens of thousands of man hours to put these things together. So the question then becomes, well, how did they get this great prosperity? Okay, how, how did they manage to spend so much time devoted to public works? What happened during that period that we're missing today? Well, it turns out that during the Central Middle Age period, there was two, two sets of, of toolboxes. We had something equivalent to our national currencies today, back then as well. But in addition, we had a, a dual currency system whereby the second currency was a local currency. And many of these local currencies had a very special uh, attribute, a thing called demurrage. Whereas today we have positive interest rates on our money. If you borrow money from the bank, you're going to have to pay that back, and you're going to also have to pay the interest on that. Well, these local currencies with demurrage charge, these local tools, um, had a negative interest rate. What does that mean? That means that you get some money and you better use it very quickly. Otherwise, there's a tax for holding on to the money. So it acted like a hot potato. As soon as you get it, you want to get rid of it. And so what this did was create what we call a velocity of exchange, far greater than anything we have today. As soon as you get the money, you use it and pass it on. And so this money circulated and circulated and circulated from the upper class to the middle class, and everybody was able to meet their basic needs with this local currency. The national currency was also in use, but it was used mostly for foreign exchange and for luxury items. The basic needs of, of most people were met through this local exchange. And that helped foster, I believe, and Bernard believes, uh, one of the greatest ages known to humankind. There's another interesting feature of this age that I want to go into for a moment. And again, we go back to the cathedrals. Notre Dame means Our Lady. So here we are during this Middle Age period, and almost the entirety of these cathedrals were dedicated not to Jesus, whose religion this is supposed to be about. Almost every single one of these cathedrals were dedicated to the Great Mother. Issues are ecological issues when these national currencies are actually just business currencies. They were brought into being several hundred years ago to foster the commerce, international trade, and the Industrial Revolution. They're industrial age monetary hammers. <coughs> so to build a society, a global economy, with agricultural, uh, industrial, and post-industrial economies, with many different needs and, and requirements and <clears throat> diverse values and sometimes contrasting values, the one set of monetary tools we're using now makes that job a lot more difficult. So what I want to talk about is some new monetary tools like monetary paintbrushes, monetary screwdrivers, things that are, can be applied to the vastly different requirements of our day. And <clears throat> I want to apply those monetary tools to the various applications, the various crises we're facing today. But I want to begin with an historical period that happened a long, long time ago but which has, I believe, direct application to what's taking place today, the political debate. Uh, today is the, what, first Tuesday of sequestration. Uh, and so on top of all the man-made crises that we've had with other realms, we now have manufactured crises on top of our economic woes here in this country. <clears throat> so let me start with this historical period and try to draw some links between the relevance of what happened then to what's taking place today. 
The period in history, in European history, between the fall of Rome and the European Renaissance, between the late 400s and the 1400s, the late 1400s, that 1,000 year period is called the Middle Ages. It's also called the Medieval Age. It's also been referred to as the Dark Ages. Um, <clears throat> In the latter part of the Middle Ages, we had the outbreak of the plague. And 19th century scholarship assumed that that entire millennium was one of dismal poverty, primitive lifestyles culminating in the plague of the 1300s. We now know, and it's only in recent decades that we know this, that there was a period in between uh, the pre-dark ages of the, the first centuries and the latter dark ages, there was this middle period called the Central Middle Ages.